Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is my first time to attend Berlin Boswell's in person, so it's really nice to be here, and even more so that I'm also getting the chance uh, to talk here as well. Um, so yeah, to introduce myself, I'm Matt. I work on search and discovery at Cookpad Global. Um, I'm going to talk about our recent journey of rebuilding our recipe search system. Um, and it's probably a good thing that we just had lunch, as search at Cookpad is pretty hungry work. Um, we just spend a lot of our time looking at recipes. Um, and I will apologize in advance that there's some accidental, not accidental, bad food puns and jokes in this talk. Uh, so don't be afraid to groan or, or cheer, I don't know, uh, as they come along. <clears throat> so to begin, I want to start with a seemingly simple statement. Um, a search team should be responsible for optimizing search relevance and improving the search experience, which is kind of uh, seems obvious. Um, and our original motivation back where we started this journey was not really anything to do with this, but more about technology and hiring as we were about to prepare for a new um, phase of product focus in search at Cookpad. We'd made then the decision to consolidate on a Python-centric stack so that we could reduce the integration gap for techniques in modern information retrieval, ML, NLP, and so on. And also to access the global community around that and, and talent in that area. But when we began the transition, we soon realized that this was probably the most important thing uh, to tackle because it wasn't actually true for us back in, in 2020. Uh, so the transition was not just technological, uh, it was also an engineering and product culture shift as well. And we began, like I said, in, in, in 2020, at the start of 2020, by uh, spinning up an experimental search team that kind of iterated quickly to prove out a new tech stack uh, that solved and targeted some of the previous system's limitations. Um, and then uh, we began rolling that system out through 2020 into 2021, did lots of experimentation in, in that period with team structures and our approach to relevance improvement. So I'm going to try and touch on a few of these topics throughout this talk. Uh, it's a little bit high level. It might be quite specific to Cookpad, um, but it might connect to other search teams or, or companies doing search out there who might have been or are in a similar position. Uh, and I'm also kind of eager to hear from other people at the conference as well about their own journeys and what they're doing, um, trying to adapt how they do search. So um, first, I haven't actually talked about Cookpad that much, um, so let me give you some context. Uh, Cookpad is the largest online community for food lovers, well, specifically home cooking, lovers of home cooking. Um, our mission is to make everyday cooking fun. Um, why do we care about that? Um, well, we believe the act of eating has a major impact on everyone's physical and mental health. And the choices we make when we cook has a big impact on our planet. And with those two things in mind, we believe there is a distinction between creators and consumers. When you're creating, for example, through, through cooking, suddenly your awareness starts to grow, you start to care more about where your ingredients come from, or how, how the taste changes, if those ingredients are in season or not. And when people start caring, they tend to make informed decisions uh, that impact not only their health, but also the environment. In the app, you can browse recipes, um, from ingredients that are in season to get inspired, or you can follow uh, amazing authors like uh, Kate Hyo, who does great vegetarian recipes. But importantly for this talk, you can search by ingredients, search by dish, search by uh, all kinds of things to find recipes. We're a global online community that is available in more than 70 countries, that supports more than um, 30 languages, and has an ever-growing catalog of uh, over six million re uh, recipes, all created by everyday chefs. Anyone, maybe someone in here has uh, authored a, uh, a recipe on Cookpad. Um, we're visited by over 50 million uh, users each month, and that scale is important for understanding um, the search problem that we have. Uh, we serve over a million searches per day, receive over 200,000 unique queries, uh, and significant uh, a non-trivial amount of uh, HTTP load. So our, our end goal with this transition um, was to try and scale up to two or three cross-functional uh, search product teams. And this is uh, roughly the mission statement for we, how, how we wanted those teams to work. 
Search teams and search engineers will identify impactful opportunities to optimize search, build solutions to solve those problems, and rigorously evaluate and validate the impact. Um, there's a few um, key ingredients in, in making this happen, and I'm gonna split this talk more into, into those two ingredients. Um, first was um, understanding and assigning appropriate responsibility and ownership over the search experience, including, in, including relevance, the really important bit. Um, and also uh, that teams should have autonomy and empowerment to build solutions while trying to navigate and manage the right amount of cognitive load to take on within the team. So starting with responsibility um, and ownership over the search experience. So before 2020, um, our situation looked a little like this. We had a search tools team that was reactively supporting these search managers. Managers are people whose day-to-day -day work is to tune search using um, internal UIs and tools built by the tools team. Um, this was manageable in the early days, but after rapidly expanding the number of countries and languages that we supported, um, we had a scaling problem. Uh, we reached 30 managers, um, all needing support and, uh, and, and input from the search tools team, and the, tool, the tools team themselves was unable to make deeper improvements to the core search engine. Um, and the destination team structures we wanted to get to um, well, it looked a bit like this. So two cross-functional search teams directly engaged with user problems, capable of driving fundamental improvements to the search experience and search relevance, and empowered to um, build technologies and solutions they needed on top of a, a search platform. I'll talk a bit about the platform transition a bit later. Um, but for now, back to the search managers. So this is um, uh, kind of a summary of how, <laughs> how they interact with Cookpad. Um, they are effectively the relevance brain for recipe search. They're local cooking experts uh, and community managers who work for Cookpad. Um, they're essentially, you know, basically doing knowledge graph tuning for search. Um, and the tools team supports through that UI. They tune the, they do some of their own tuning with the, the, the core search engine, things like bug fixes, um, tweaking text analyzers, that kind of thing. Um, and the managers are responsible for the search metrics. Um, and they are the direct interface with the users and, and the queries. Their workflow is a, is a per query one, like a, a greedy, um, poorly performing query approach. So they look at this queue of frequently searched queries from the last week, uh, specifically the poorly performing ones. They investigate why the results might be poor uh, using their own local knowledge of the domain uh, of cooking, understanding what the users are expecting, um, and understanding how, uh, their, their own understanding of the search logic. Um, they make some changes to, to optimize the query, making updates to the knowledge graph. Um, they then see uh, how the results have changed, immediately go back again and tweak if needed, uh, at some point stop, and then move on to the next query. They might also make a note to check again on that query in a few days, just to see how it's performing. Um, so this enabled, uh, over many years, kind of rapid improvement um, in search quality. But by 2020, a lot of our, our, our regions, our key regions were quite mature with that graph, and we, we'd reached uh, some common pitfalls with this approach. Um, first, obviously, by comparing online metrics, you're compa uh, sorry, if you're doing consecutive testing, uh, you're just comparing apples and oranges. There's all kinds of reasons why that CTR might have changed one week to the next. Uh, so the poor search manager doesn't have all that information available. Um, so no A-B testing, and in fact, on the old system, A-B testing was, was really hard. Um, also, like I said a, a bit earlier, we'd reached diminishing returns, really, with a lot of those countries and languages. Um, we had yeah, very mature dictionaries and, uh, and knowledge graphs, and so the per-change value is quite small. Um, and because the managers are operating with kind of limited information, they don't know about the side effects that they might be having by optimizing one query, but the impacts on, on other queries. And of course, that approach prioritizes the head of the volume because they're always picking the most frequent poorly performing stuff and it's harder for them to have enough time to get into the, into the middle or, or the tail of the distribution. And like most search projects, search products were, were very heavy tailed. Um, over 50% of our searches are outside the, the um, top tens of thousands of queries. So it's hard for a manager to get into those in a typical week. 
Um, and there's you know lots of uh, in infrequent variations like uh, drop spaces or um, semantic queries that they could be tackling or, or the team could be tackling, but they're unable to get into. So our first step was to move responsibility as part of this transition to the new search teams. And that responsibility was around the, uh, the metrics, so owning the search metrics and trying to move them became the responsibility of the search product team. Search managers are still working, but the ownership is over here. And that enabled a change in perspective as well and greater alignment with what we wanted to do with the product. So we could redefine the focus and instead shift, for example, um, to conversions rather than, than clicks. A lot of the approach is about clicks. Um, clicks are still important, but we wanted to move more towards uh, mission-aligned uh, metrics, higher-level things. I mean, as a cooking company running a recipe search, we wanted our users to be cooking recipes, not just clicking them. Um, so we kind of moved to start thinking about cook-through rate rather than click-through rate, and also think about session-level um, metrics as well, moving people along the whole search session um, to find a recipe to cook. Um, yeah, so, yeah, cooking, quite important. Um, so we also wanted to get the best of both. Um, but to start, like, on the, on the search product team side, um, we wanted to introduce um, the opportunity analysis so that we could size uh, potential opportunities and also A-B test any experiments that, that we released. And that's something that the product teams are, are great at being able to do. And they can also explore you know, hypotheses through data and, and kind of offline evaluate things, um, explore things that way. Um, but we also want to main, maintain contact with the search managers. They have their own um, strengths and, uh, and ways that they can, they can help us. They have deep knowledge of local culture and cooking. They're fluent in local languages. Um, they have frequent contact with the users. And even though we managed to get to two search teams, they're still, those teams are still vastly outnumbered by the number of countries um, and languages. But one of the challenges is actually how do we coordinate between these two? Um, we still want search managers to continue their optimization workflows, but we also wanted to give space for the search teams to make more sweeping improvements to the core engine. And we were beginning to experiment with alternative retrieval and ranking strategies, which could potentially conflict with the expectation of, of search managers. Uh, segments. <laughs> um, so we found uh, over a bit of time that um, one effective strategy, a strategy was to use query segments as a driver for change. So just like how oranges are best enjoyed segmented, so is relevance improvement. Um, so sometimes these uh, are more concretely called cohorts or categories, but I kind of wanted to have orange segments on a screen. Um, <clears throat> so to make this change, uh, uh, this practice more tangible, a segment in our domain is, for example, single ingredient queries. So we bucketed up, bucketed up all our queries like this and targeted these for, uh, for improvement efforts. Um, this, no, there's some nice benefits of this approach. Um, you can divide and conquer with segments, assign them to different teams potentially, um, stop people treading on each other's shoes. Um, and uh, we can also get into the head, torso and tail of the distribution. Um, and most importantly, or most pleasingly, it was also a touch point for communication. So we could say to the search managers or the rest of the organization, hey, we're going to do something here, stand back. Um, if there's anything wrong, please come to us. But yeah, we're experimenting. And these are kind of you know, very domain-aligned uh, concepts like you know, dishes or ingredients or whatever. Um, so everyone could understand them. Make it even more concrete, here's a, uh, an example of uh, summarizing it all as like a, um, in a segment description card. Um, so a good component of when you're describing a segment is to have the name of it, short name, like uh, single ingredient queries, um, and have a, a, a kind of grounded understanding of, of the intent. So um, for example, in this case, you know, the searcher wants to cook with this ingredient to find something to cook. You need a way to reliably classify, ideally automatically classify, those queries as belonging to a segment and not, for example, through NER, and have an idea of uh, which countries and languages you're targeting. And um, we also, like I said, wanted to build in opportunity analysis and impact analysis into this, into this process. So before building anything, 
um, we would uh, look at how big the opportunity might be, for example, in this case, over 15% uh, of the search volume, um, other things like number of queries, number of users, um, and measure the current quality, so have an idea of where we are right now, and then maybe through prototyping uh, or, or best efforts, maybe a hunch, decide um, how much of an uplift we might have on the metric, in this case, um, CTR. And that's quite useful for sample size planning as well. The idealized uh, workflow for product teams and search engineers became uh, something like this. Nothing groundbreaking, of course, um, but a lot of it was, was new to us. Um, and the key bit for this routine was um, having the steps of having the hunch and then trying to capture it as a segment um, or if we already had an existing segment we're working on um, using that. And then that drives the opportunity analysis, impact analysis, um, and also decisions about whether we should progress or not um, to online experimentation. And at the end of that, have confidence about whether we should adopt, abandon, or, or iterate with that, uh, with that experiment or feature. One thing we had to deal with, one question we had was, where do those hunches come from? How do we know what's, what's worth considering? Um, and sometimes there's a critique uh, with a process like this that maybe it moves the pendulum far too uh, into, um, into abstract metrics and becomes a bit more disconnected from user problems. Uh, and I think, I really believe that's actually quite avoidable. The good hunches come from teams and engineers knowing their users. Um, also facilit facilitated, of course, by product managers and user research. Um, but to be effective at this, um, we wanted that ongoing connection between engineers and, and the domain. And the more members that had that, the better. So we ultimately, it was about quantitative, a, a quantitative approach and also having that qualitative connection. Um, so you have you know, the models, the methods, uh, and, and the metrics, the opportunity size, impact analysis, experiment design. Um, and also we set ourselves the target of launching a, a new online experiment every week. And to keep that um, qualitative connection, uh, we had got into the routine of, uh, of doing things like weekly query triage with, uh, with search managers, checking in with the search managers, running user interviews, uh, dog fooding, so us being the user and coming, coming up with our own ideas of what we'd like. Um, and we also built a qualitative feedback form on the search results page so we could get all kinds of crazy, wild, amazing feedback from users about uh, why our, our results are good, or uh, quite often they complained <laughs> about lots of things. <clears throat> um, and we really wanted each, each um, member of, the, of our search teams to see real, que real queries every week. Um, and looking at recipe search queries can be a real joy. Uh, Look at this wonderful, wonderful one from Indonesia, which says, uh, it's a query where someone's looking for the easiest method to make a cheese stick that is proven and has the dominant taste of cheese. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's got everything. It's got a dish. It's got a difficulty. It's got a taste. Uh, yeah. So I think it's, in this domain, it's actually quite exciting <laughs> to be trawling through, through queries. Um, so that's uh, a little bit of a tour of responsibility and ownership and, and moving that. Um, on the other side of the coin, I'm going to talk a bit about autonomy uh, and empowerment to build solutions to the problems that we were identifying. Um, so before 2020, um, the, we had that team structure I showed earlier um, with an SRE team down here supporting the, the tools team. And the SRE team owned most of the infrastructure components. And any changes to those were done by request to the team, which was manageable at first, but again, you started scaling. Um, and also, those SREs are eventually managing eight, um, or supporting, I should say, eight uh, product teams. They became very stretched, had a very long backlog, uh, limited time to maintain all the infrastructure for a global application, um, including maintaining uh, then an aging elastic search cluster. Um, and there was also a gap between search engineers and them being able to add and manage new components to help them build solutions. And they were also less familiar with the operational and performance considerations of those components too. And finally, the SRE team were also owning the SLOs, which is not a great place for them. So they're really busy and also um, responsible for a lot, of the, uh, a lot of alerts. So at the time, there was also a lot of technological shift at Cookpad. Um, we changed a lot of the, started changing a lot of the, the deployment layer. Um, but also for search, 
we started transitioning um, the application layer, like I said, towards a, a Python-centric stack. Kickstarting that change, in, on the search side, um, we assembled a, a team, an experimental search team, um, put a few people together with uh, capabilities or an interest in the infrastructure side, as well as the application. And they moved quickly to, to try out a few things, de-risk options, um, autonomously build what they needed. It was a very, like a, a very productive period in, in terms of trying out lots of stuff, but it did add some premature complexity, which we, we retreated from um, on a few occasions. One example, we briefly adopted Apache Spark for some compute workflows. Um, turns out it was definitely premature for what we needed. Um, when you're in this, one of these teams busy learning a new stack and some of these people trying Python for the first time, one thing they didn't want to see is all their errors turning into JVM stack trace murder mysteries. Um, so we retreat from that. Um, on a more genuine note also, we took on a lot of infrastructure complexity within that team. Um, moving to Kubernetes meant there was a lot more responsibility for the infrastructure. And we realized that not everyone wanted to become a full-time YAML engineer. Um, it was great for growing our engineers in, in, in DevOps and infrastructure, which you know, it's, it's been very useful for them since, since then, going into, into now and through the transition. Um, but it did take up too much cognitive load. Um, and for most of our engineers, they wanted to be focused on solving user problems. Uh, and there's a lot of overlap between what people were doing. So basically, we'd reached the point where we had too many cooks in the kitchen and needed to find a new way of working. Has anyone come across the Team Topologies book? I'm sure lots of you have. Yeah, awesome. So we borrowed a load of ideas from there, um, particularly the, the, the insights around team structures um, and platform teams, uh, the relationship with platform teams. Um, and one of the compelling ideas was to maximize the amount of time that product teams focus on the user value stream or whatever the product stream value stream is for them and minim minimize the load from all the other sources. Um, so with that as a reference, we transitioned to team structures like this. We set up um, team around, uh, goals around teams and ownership boundaries. Product teams obviously need to focus on the user problems and they have the autonomy to introduce new technologies and solutions on top of this, uh, at the time, emerging internal development platform. Um, and they also take on the responsibility of building it, running it, and owning it, that kind of philosophy. And we had them define and own product-relevant service-level objectives and participate in an on-call rotation to support those out of hours. From the platform team side, their mission is to try and continuously help reduce the extraneous cognitive load from those product teams and support ownership up there, uh, and doing that through that, that internal development platform in the middle. And this was, at the beginning, at the beginning this was quite specific to the search stack, um, but over time we had a few other platform teams and kind of brought things together to align on one, one IDP. And getting there was a, quite another transition. Um, in order to make that happen and mature those team structures, uh, we realized we needed help for a bit of time from an SRE, so we kind of lured one of those away um, from the SRE team into the experimental search team, uh, mostly with the promise uh, of frequent lunches cooked in the office. Um, they shared their ex expertise in, in site reliability engineering and in building platforms so that both product um, and platform engineers were ready to support the systems they own when we split them out. And we use this transition to divide that stack and establish appropriate responsibilities. And then the final step, of course, once, once that's been set up with one of the product search teams and we, um, we, might, we got to a point where the old system wasn't needing to be maintained and wasn't live anymore, we moved the search tools team into a, to become its own, well, realigned things a bit and then um, made them into these two search product teams. And that's the final arrangement. Um, after that transition, we've got the user problems coming in and the uh, search, recipe search team and search experience team focused on those, and they get support um, from the search platform team and, and build things on top of the um, development platform. Um, an example of, of one of the projects uh, in that period was uh, building the replacement search admin UI. We had a, uh, one, of the, one of the teams managing that. Um, they ran sessions with the search managers to understand their requirements. They developed their own system design 
uh, deciding on a Django app with a Postgres backend, and they deployed the relevant components themselves on the developer platform. Um, if they ever needed assistance from the platform team, I don't know if they niche thing about AWS they didn't understand or, or doing something in Terraform or in, with Kubernetes or customized manifests, they got the support they needed. Um, and they defined the interfaces with the rest of the system, defined appropriate monitoring SLOs and so on, again, using tools from the, from the platform layer um, and made those part of um, appropriate uh, um, SLOs uh, as part, and alerting as part of that, that rotation, the on-call rotations. Okay, so that's a brief outline, again, of the whole journey that we went on um, at CokePad um, with search engineering, focusing on fostering responsibility and ownership for search relevance, and also autonomy empowerment on, the, on building the solutions and owning them. And since then, we've, uh, we've run loads of projects, um, launched many great new features, um, including a redesign of the search results page, the introduction of search filters for the first time, um, made significant and continuous improvements to segments that were a priority to us, um, and have the evidence along with that to prove that those improvements were, were uh, genuine and reliable. Um, we did other things like improve um, response times. We've got um, people on pager duty rotation, for, for instance, uh, which um, the good news is for me and my engineers that uh, they're very, very rare, only a few a year, um, so we all get a lot of sleep. And we've, we've also hired and trained um, almost 10 really, really talented search engineers and search scientists. Before finishing, I'll give a quick plug to our engineering blog. On there, you can find some articles uh, about search machine learning and things we're doing in that area, including personalized recommendations, uh, learning to boost, and so on. It's called Source Diving, so just sourcediving.com. Um, and there's a post on there, because um, I haven't really talked about actually doing the system and traffic migration um, from the old search to the new one. And I won't go into details now, it's in the post. Um, but we used Strangler fig pattern, um, and um, we had some kind of, we had the luxury of having two systems, which I know is kind of rare, uh, not everyone gets that. Uh, and that was kind of useful because it meant we could go through phases of shadow traffic and having live load on both systems to check, check that. Um, it meant also um, we had a reference system for doing, getting into the, um, the process of doing relevance optimizations. So you've got a baseline that you're trying to attack and improve. Um, and we're able to do progressive rollout, which means you know, we can move live traffic bit by bit um, onto the new system. Um, and we had a, the, the lovely safety net of auto retry onto the old system as well, um, where the interfaces made sense. Um, through this, when we were doing this transition, we wanted to avoid stopping product development. So eventually there were things on the new system that weren't on the old one. Um, and in terms of managing that relationship with search managers, uh, for the key core recipe search um, features, we moved those over country by country, which meant we could kind of have a group of, of search managers and, and inform them that thing, you know, things are going to change. That was a great period for doing query triage. So we worked with them. They were like, oh, no, I learned the word desastroso which in Spanish I think means disastrous, um, uh, which was how they regarded one of the queries on the new system. Um, so that was a nice process uh, to, um, to get into the, uh, the flow of doing of green relevance improvement. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry if all these photos of food might have made you a bit hungrier. Um, I'm aware that this is maybe quite particular to Cookpad. Um, um, we're not the first company to transition uh, the ways of working in teams like this. Um, some things uh, that I'd like to learn from other people here um, at Buzzwords as well. So yeah, don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, I was going to find QR codes for the Android app and the iOS apps, but I found this instead, which is a really nice QR code cookie <laughs> by one of the by a cook I don't know if it works. I don't know where it'll take you, um, so don't try it. Uh, or maybe do and uh, let me know. Um, there's uh, our website as well. There's a web app as well as the, um, as the native apps. Um, our blog's there. Uh, yeah, thank you for listening. I'm eager to take any questions.